Okay, I'm broadcasting, guys. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to introduce? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got folks rolling in. Oh, my God. Good morning, God. guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or morning. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's not morning. It's afternoon. <laughs> good, good afternoon, guys. If you're rolling in, we'll give people a couple minutes to roll in. Uh, my name is T. I work over at Keep Growing Detroit, and we're with um, our lead farmer over at the farm, uh, Molly. She's at the Keep Growing Detroit farm down at Eastern Market. Um, so, Molly, we'll give people a couple minutes just to roll in. Okay. Um, and <laughs> peace, Brianna. Priyana, sorry. Peace, Joshua. Okay. Peace, Fatima. All right. People rolling in. Talking about the hot crops. <laughs> so you know what? I um I usually uh let me pull the poll. Let me pull the uh chat box up. There we go. I usually hey Jamila. Hey Sharon, checking in with you. Peace, Zora. Hope everybody is doing well this afternoon. It's supposed to be a, a really warm day. So I'm planning a campfire, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. I've already got the s'mores situation for the kids. Hey, yeah, Gloria. Definitely. <laughs> hey, Lawrence. Hey, Ms. Carlton. Hey, Elijah, what's up? Elijah is one of our our youth um, our youth leaders. Hey Betty. Hey Tim. Hey Tony. Um, all right, we you got a good majority. And um, I forgot to create a poll, you guys. Hey David, I, I miss your face, man. <laughs> See all the folks in the chat box. Um, I forgot to create a poll before we before we launched our practice. And so, but I really wanted to get an understanding for, um, I always want to know who's in the room with us. Uh, peace, Kat. Sorry, <laughs> Margarita. Don't call me Miss Carlton. I feel you. <laughs> I really want to get a sense for who's in the room. If, you, um, if you're new to Zoom, we, uh, we use the chat box to interact with each other. Hey, Linda, uh, to interact with each other and to ask questions. So find the chat box. And if you could just let me know if you are, um, yes, keeping me saying too, Ms. Joyce. Um, if you can let me know if you've already picked up your hot crops from Keep Growing Detroit. If you are a GRP member, you should have gotten a link to pick up your hot crops. Um, if you've already got those, um, hey, LaVon, if you picked up, let us know in the chat box, okay? I want to see who's uh, picked up Monday. Good. Picked up Annie. Good. Got your crops. Good, good, good. DJ's getting her this weekend. All right, all right. I have my, looks like most people, I'm not a member, but um, I'm new to growing. Okay, well, well, maybe you can become a member. It'd be great. Um, I'm a member and I've picked up good. Looks like most people, hey, you're new to the group. Okay, we'll tell you a little bit about the Garden Resource Program. Um, Joshua, glad you're connecting. I didn't know you were new, good. Ooh. Gary. Hey, Gary Miller. <laughs> Glad you picked up. Betty, you picked up good. That's okay, so sweet. Got... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I the chat function. I didn't even know that existed. That's amazing. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Are you following along there? I am. All right. Um, Nicole, <laughs> you're new. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, okay. Let me just say for a quick minute. Um, oh, and DJ got her native plants. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> oh, you're picking up your native plants this weekend. All right. Awesome. Yes. You know what? I did not get my order in. I'm kind of mad. I think they're almost <laughs> gone. <laughs> Partner of Food Sovereignty. Woo woo. Yeah. Let me explain the garden research program for folks who are new. Um, volunteer at Urban Farm NYC. Oh, awesome. I'm glad you're joining us. Maybe you can tell us what's going on there. But um, hey, Pat, you got yours. Good, good, good. So. Um, Keep Growing Detroit facilitates uh, one of the oldest gardening programs in the city. It's called the Garden Resource Program. 
Um, and even before, so that's been about 13 to 15 years old, 2003. Somebody help me with my math. 17 years, goodness gracious. <laughs> um, I know that the Garden Resource Program started in 2003. And even prior to that, there was a, a program run by the city um, called the Farm -A Lot Program. Some folks may remember that program. Um, so there's, uh, there's always been this strong sense of gardening in Detroit and the Garden Resource Program, when city services kind of dwindled, um, there was a few nonprofits that got together and said, you know what, um, we can't let this service die. We got to have gardeners in the city. Uh, local food production is an important thing. And um, they started the Garden Resource Program, which provides seeds and plants to gardeners across the city. Um, we just reached our 1700 garden for the season. So we're over 1700 gardens right now. That's backyard gardens and community gardens. And then there's some people who are growing for market. So they're, you know, they're wanting to take their food to, to um, Eastern market and sell it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then we also facilitate, we have a two acre farm and Molly's uh, the farmer at the, at the, uh, the main farmer at the farm. And, um, and so, uh, Hey, em Emily. Oh, oh, <laughs> Emily, jump online and, and uh, pay online. Uh, we'll got to see if there's any plants left. That's what I wanted to make sure. But maybe me and you can sidebar. There's some left. Boom. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, every year folks join. They pick up seeds and plants from us. And then there's all kind of classes that we do. And normally we would be in front of you. You'd be at the farm or at a community center and we'd be talking to you. But um, because of COVID, obviously, we moved all our classes online um, and have made them uh, free through uh, at least through May. And we're, we're going to see if things open up. Um, normally, we charge three bucks. If you want to, I can drop a link if you want to donate um, a little to keep growing to trade to help us keep this programming going. Um, that would be great. Um, so I'll find that link while Molly gets jumping on this code hot crop. So it looks like most people have picked up their hot crops. So that's good. Um, and we're going to go through and tell you about it. You about ready, Molly? I'm good. Whenever you're good. Okay. I'm going to just go to the next slide. Boom. Plan your garden. <laughs> Cool. So let's start. Hi, everybody. I can't believe it. there's 77 of you. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Usually this class is 25 people. It's amazing to be able to reach all of you folks uh, electronically in this weird time. I miss you all. <laughs> it's been really, really strange uh, being uh, just staff on the farm. So happy to connect in this way. It's really cool. Um, yeah, make sure that you're, te you're, you're texting your questions as we go. Um, I think, you know, we'll, we'll get through the content and then we'll do our best to answer your questions as we see them rolling in um, towards the end. Uh, and before we begin, um, I'm going to reference two documents and the first one is on the screen. So um, KGD for every, um, at the beginning of the season creates the Grow Your Garden document that you see on the screen. Um, that is available at the KGD website. Um, if you go to the KGD website and then um, to the page specifically for the Garden Resource Program, you can find PDF versions of that to download. And that shows you all the seeds and transplants that we have to distribute to you guys, to members. And I wanna call attention to the backside of that piece of paper, which gives you information on uh, how to plant and when to plant those varieties. Um, so it'll give you planting windows and plant spacing information and seeding rates and days to maturity. So that's a great document to have. Um, and then the next document, which I'm grabbing right now, <laughs> is uh, located on the same part of the website. Um, and it's, I don't know if you can see it, um, but it's this uh, 2020 Garden Resource Program Hot Crop Planting Instructions document. Um, this is specific to the hot crops that you guys just picked up or some of you may be picking up next week. Um, I'm gonna be referencing it. And uh, uh, if there's anything that, there are a lot of details on here that, um, 
you can reference on your own. This is full of information. So this is uh, planting information, when, how, and the varieties that you got. And then more like, there's more detail for, for example, like eggplant and the like. Um, so you can go grab yourself a copy of this. If you didn't get it at the distribution at the KGD farm, you can find it on the website. Um, and if you guys have it in front of you, you can follow along. Um, cool. So let's talk about, sorry, I'm like going through my PowerPoint. <laughs> let's talk about um, some general care tips um, for all of the transplants and seeds that you guys just picked up. Um, so, this week, we gave you guys a whole bunch of these, right? And a whole bunch of these. So we're going to go through uh, the different kind of crop families more specifically. But to start, let's just talk about, um, in general, hot crops, like as a whole. Some general rules for when to plant and how to plant and what they need. So um, if you're following along on the PowerPoint, um, in general, um, hot crops, specifically veggies, um, they're annual crops and they benefit from having full blazing sun. There are some exceptions to that rule, but uh, when choosing a location in your garden to plant these guys, uh, you want to make sure that they're getting uh, 8 to 10 hours of sunlight a day. Um, that is what they want. Um, so if you're putting stuff in a shadier location, you may get smaller, like less beefy plant growth out of them and maybe smaller fruit. So make sure that you're planting them in full blazing sun. Um, also make sure that they're getting enough water, especially the ones that have uh, large fruit like your melons or your uh, tomatoes and peppers. Um, a good general rule of thumb is at least um, an inch of either rain or hand watering a week. Um, so be mindful of that. If you're leaving for vacation, <laughs> make sure that you have a friend to come in and make sure that your hot crops are getting watered regularly. Um, a good rule of thumb with watering is to water deeply. So like water a lot, like most of that inch um, in a go instead of watering more regularly and shallow. Um, the roots need um, periods of like lots of water and then they like to kind of like have period where they're slightly dry before they get the next water. And if your plants are um, consistently wet, um, they're not getting what they need and you might actually be uh, uh, hurting the roots, hurting the plants. So make sure that you're watering deeply, less regularly instead of watering shallowly all the time. Uh, and that's very, like, if you're a container gardener, um, I'm looking at you. Uh, make sure that you're not just getting the top of the soil wet every day. Uh, make sure that you're watering deeply. Stick your finger in there to make sure that's happening. And then letting it dry and then watering again. Cool. Um, and if you want to uh, help uh, keep the water um, in the soil longer, uh, you can mulch. Uh, you can either use wood chips or leaves or straw. A lot of people use straw um, or hay um, to kind of keep the soil moist and also keep all of those like beneficial soil organisms happy and working for you in the soil um, in partnership with all of your plants. Um, also, key into appropriate plant and seed spacing. Very important. A lot of that information is available on your um, seed and plant instruction guide, um, but we'll be talking about that in greater depth in a minute. Um, very important that you don't overcrowd um, so that you have the healthiest plants that you can. Um, hey, hey, Molly, I had a quick question for you in yeah. the box. Um, looks like it's been raining all week. Um, would you say it's been enough rain or would you, would you have people water one more time? I would, if people haven't already planted, um, I think it's important that when you do plant, you water in your plants. So if you're going to be planting um, uh, maybe this weekend, check and see how moist your soil is. But it's a good idea to water them in at planting so that the roots can settle um, 
when you do plant your plants, and I'll show you, we'll demo that in a minute, um, you don't want to compress the plant in there and then compress the soil down. Um, so watering in um, after you plant um, has the added benefit of gently settling the soil around the roots um, so that the roots are kind of not getting like smished by compaction, just like gently being watered down um, around the roots. So um, check if there's standing water like and you've got heavy clay soils and it's still really wet, water lightly. Um, but if your soil is dry, um, I'm looking at the clouds and like, I don't, maybe it's going to rain, maybe it's not. Uh, yeah, be mindful. If you're already getting um, an inch of rain in the past week, water lightly or don't water um, until absolutely necessary. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so like make sure you check it because it depends on your soil type, basically. Yeah. In a, in a way too. Okay, and then have you ever used the cedar bedding for mulching? Cedar bedding. Cedar. Mm -hmm. um, not directly on the plants. Um, pathways uh, you can mulch with. Um, I wouldn't use cedar on the beds. Um, like if it's going to be close and around your plants, I'd use something like either leaves from your garden. Don't grab your neighbor's leaves or leaves that are from another place. Um, use leaves and leaf litter that's local um, so that you're not inadvertently bringing an unknown contaminant like another like tree disease or um, some people spray you know so make sure that if you're using leaf litter it's leaf litter that you generated on your property so that you can ensure that you're not bringing unwanted diseases onto your garden also straw straw and hay straw is more expensive than hay so usually hay um, is a really good um, way to mulch. I've seen cardboard boxes being used too. You can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those coffee bags, those burlap sacks yeah. are another kind of re free resource. Um, and then Leslie was asking, uh, do we have mulch? We don't have mulch right now. Sometimes in the fall we do uh, when we get it donated. Um, I recommend going to a landscaping company or a home, you know, like a home supply company. I got some at Myers. There you but, go. <laughs> um, you know, so um, shop around. Um, Olivia, I see your question. I'm going to try to answer that in the chat box, but we can keep going, Molly. Okay, cool. Then the last note is um, make sure that it's it's here. Make sure that you're weeding regularly um, with everything um, to make sure that the weeds you want to get on top of them before the season gets underway. Uh, make sure, of course, when you're prepping your beds uh, for planting your hot crops that you do a thorough weeding um, and make sure that you stay on top of it so in the middle of the summer you're not overwhelmed. So a little bit of weeding every week uh, will save your back and keep your plants happier for sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you So when you're mulching the, with the straw, do you turn it in? to the soil every year? Do you rake it off or what do you recommend on that? I, I rake it in because <laughs> I think uh, at the end of the season, I'm kind of shot, but by the end of the season, um, some of your uh, straw and hay has probably already started to compost and break down. Um, uh, so some of it's already kind of starting to be incorporated. You don't want to mix too, too much of that uh, material in at the end of the season. Um, it will uh, uh, sequester nitrogen in your soil. If you've got too much of it, it'll actually keep it from being readily available to plants that you plant um, potentially next season if it's a lot. Um, but if you're not using too, too much of it and it's already kind of partially composted, you can mix it in um, and it's just going to add more organic material and help build your soils over the years. So you can mix it in. Yep. Okay. Same with leaf litter, leaves and what have you, what you rake up. Okay. I'm on the seed uh, slide. Is that where you are? GRP hot weather seeds. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Cool. Follow, following you. <laughs> okay, and I'm following you. We're going back. To um, so, uh, GRP hot weather seeds. Oh my goodness, we gave you a lot. <laughs> um, so, um, these all these seeds can be planted um, after the uh, fear of frost 
um, which of course Michigan threw us a curveball, right? We all got snowed on uh, a week ago. So even then it's like usually the second week of May for Detroit where uh, we should be in the clear. But of course it seems like in Michigan we always get that like last minute snow or frost or freeze where it's like 30 degrees and almost Mother's Day. So you always want to be watching uh, the weather reports. Um, uh, full disclosure, I planted some stuff way too early and lost it uh, to the freeze. Um, so don't do that. <laughs> um, but uh, safe assumption that this weekend we are in the clear. Uh, we are looking for as gardeners um, not just the uh, in, like the air temperature to be warm, but we're also keying into uh, the soil temperature being warm. So the seeds that we gave you, so the beans and the squash and the greens and all of that, um, like germinating in soil temps that are above 65 degrees. And we get there by having uh, several days of, you know, air temperature that is well above 65 degrees. So it takes a minute for the soil to warm up. Um, and so don't be looking for that first 70 degree day to plant. Look for the fourth or fifth day where the temperatures are high because that means the soil has warmed to the point where you can put your hot crops in the ground and they'll be happy. Um, and that also gives you the opportunity to harden off your plants a little bit so these guys um, have been growing in here um, for a while. They've been protected from the elements. Um, so even though we usually talk about hardening off with cold crops, these guys still need a minute to acclimate to being outside, um, not just for like the air temps, but also for wind and uh, mostly wind and uh, some weather. So still give them a couple days or a day or two where you're bringing them outside for a few hours when it's warm out and then bringing them back into a sheltered space or covering with row cover or like putting them in you know, your garage, whatever, so that they can get used to living outside. Um, so don't forget to harden them off a little bit. It's not as extensive as with the cold crops, but you still want to give them, you know, a little bit of a, you know, adjustment period. Um, so after you've done that um, and the soil is warm and we're past our last frost date, um, we're good to go. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Yep. A couple questions for you, Molly. Um, yeah. So uh, Catherine was wondering, like, uh, are you testing, are you uh, measuring the soil temperature? And if so, how deep do you go when you measure? You can get a soil gauge. I think they go down to, we're really talking about like six or eight inches um, into the soil. Um, you can buy a soil gauge. I don't have a soil gauge, it's temperature gauge. Um, I look at, uh, I look at how the weeds are doing sometimes. And also I'm looking at um, the, the temperature, the, the air temperature um, mm -hmm. for, you know, a good week of continuous, you know, it's, 65 70 degrees okay we're good to go yeah um, yep not that fancy a lot of people right. just have you know farmers have soil gauges um but for gardeners i'd say just like watch for a good week of warm weather and then you should be good right and then just like backing up for two seconds joshua said what exactly are hot crops oh man <laughs> hot crops that's awesome. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you, you gotta like switch gears. So hot crops need a certain amount of day length and heat in order to push them through uh, their life cycle. Um, they, they are temperature dependent and they, uh, they thrive in warm, long days um, in order to move them from root growth to shoot growth to vegetative growth, to flowering, and to fruiting. Um, so they require long, hot days in order for the plant to get all of those signals to get fruiting. On the flip side, cold crops prefer lower temperatures or have, can germinate at lower temperatures. We're often uh, trying to keep them in a place where they're doing vegetative growth and not flowering. So they can tolerate or they grow better in shorter days, cooler air temperatures, 
Um, so that's that's kind of like the, the botany perspective on what, what differentiates cold crops and hot crops. Um, so um, yeah, that does that answer your question? Have, mm -hmm. have a follow-up question? Yep, yep, he said yep. Excellent. Um, and at the end of this, you guys are going to see my email. So if you do have any more questions, you can always uh, shoot me a, uh, an email. Um, we're always around. Um, so yeah, these are hot crops. And then you'll see fall crops uh, in the fall, uh, in July. Um, those guys, same deal. They're looking for decreasing daylight, cooler overnight temperatures, shorter days. You know, they tend to be like leafy greens and things that um, we want to keep in like a, a uh, vegetative growth stage. Um, so yeah, we're, we're planting certain things at certain times because of their, you know, their biological need and uh, the fact that they're keying into different environmental factors throughout the season to do the things that we want them to do. Cool. Are we ready to launch into more specifics? Um, yeah, just one question though. Uh, do the hot crops need the um, day night hot cool cycle, even though um, it's pronounced? Even though it's pronounced, I'm sorry, Catherine. Can you uh, is that Cat or Catherine? Can you um, clarify that question? Um, yeah. Pro less pronounced, sorry. <laughs> Do hot crops need that alternate cycle, that hot cool cycle, even though it's less pronounced? They do. Yeah, <laughs> got it. <laughs> yep. Okay, um, and then uh, Joshua, I saw your question about the garden resource program. We can definitely chat about that um, when, the, when the PowerPoint is done. Very cool, cool. So yeah, now we're on, we're going to get into more specifics. So you'll see this on the screen. Um, so maybe have this in front of you or pull up a browser with it um, on the KGD website. Cool. So let's talk about seeds <laughs> and then we'll get into transplants. So now we're on GRP hot crop seeds. We're going to talk specifically about squash. So you got the slide up. There it is. Sorry, I was still on the chart. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, yeah, the chart. So if we do want to back up the, the chart, um, we've taken the portion of the Grow Your Garden doc that deals specifically with hot crops and pulled it out and put it on the hot crop instructions. Um, so you'll see on it that there's uh, all the things that you got from us, seeds and transplants. Um, the days to harvest, so those are the, I guess to, to, to clarify terms, days to harvest is day from germination to your first harvest. So for example, the first one on the list, basil, from the time it germinates through the time where you should be harvesting, 70 days within reason. Um, and it'll say next to it um, appropriate spacing for those basal transplants and that um, our planting window for basal transplants is May through July. So you'll see those boxes grayed out um, and that's your window. Um, so folks who are starting them at home uh, to have a continuous supply of basal, um, you can plant basal transplants in May and you can plant basal transplants as late as July. Um, in order to extend your harvest into the early fall, um, if that makes sense. And for folks in the Garden Resource Program, we gave you your basil in May, you planted in May, and then it's your job to tend to them and harvest them appropriately so you have leaves all the way through July, August. Make sense? Cool. Kidoki. So let's talk about squash. Um, and I've pulled out like information that I think is most pertinent, the things that the questions that I get the most. So this isn't like the full information on like how to plant and how to maintain squash. This is kind of like my helpful tips. So if you have questions, let us know. 
Um, so for squash, I can't stress it enough that spacing is really important. Um, uh, we gave you a couple different kinds. So we gave you winter squash and summer squash. Um, they're a little different. Um, so with winter squash, uh, you're gonna plant them now and then roughly 80 to 90, sometimes depending on the variety, more than 90 days later is when you're gonna be harvesting. It's a one-off crop. Um, and with summer squash, you're gonna plant it um, and then you're gonna have, if you're on top of harvesting, you're gonna have a continuous supply for a longer harvest window before the plant ends its cycle. Um, so first let's talk about, yeah, spacing. Um, so I recommend that you're uh, sowing your squash seeds about two feet apart. Some people can like get them to be closer, but you always want to be thinking about, it's hard to do this, but you want to be thinking about the plant when it's mature. Squash will be two, sometimes three feet tall, summer squash will be two, sometimes three feet tall and like two, two and a half feet wide. So your zucchinis and your yellow crookneck and your yellow zucchinis, that's a big plant. Um, so even though it's hard, when you're just putting tiny seeds in the ground, make sure that you're giving them enough space um, so that your plants can thrive. Plants that are spaced too close together are gonna be stealing resources from each other. When their leaves intermingle, you're gonna be spreading diseases faster throughout your garden. So you gotta be thinking about adult size, good spacing, the amount of you know, nutrients going to the right number of plants, and also really good airflow through and around your plants um, through the season. Um, when you do plant your squash, some people like hill up the soil a little bit. Um, uh, so like mounds, sometimes people do. And in the middle of that mound, uh, one, I would recommend two seeds. Um, in my experience, uh, a squirrel or something is gonna come along and probably dig out at least one of those guys uh, in the night. <laughs> Um, so you want to uh, plant two, maybe sometimes three, um, no more, like definitely not one seed per mound um, in order to make sure that you uh, end up with one good plant per mound. Because um, it sucks when you put one seed in the mound, a squirrel comes along, you don't find out until two or three weeks later, and then you've got a void or you've missed your squash window. So couple of seeds in a mound two feet away from the next squash plant or other plant. Um, and with winter squash, um, they don't form like a bush per se, acorn squash does, but the red curry squash, the butternuts, and the hubbards are all trailing varieties. Um, if you planted them before, you know that they tend to just take off in a direction and you'll get squash, you know, nine feet away from where the plant is actually rooted. Um, so be mindful of that. As you see the plant taking off, you can kind of pick the vine up gently and move it around so that it's a little more contained, but it is going to want to take off and make squash somewhere else. Um, so be mindful of that. Um, don't put squash right in the middle of your raised bed because it's going to overwhelm everybody. Um, so maybe plant your winter squash on the edge or somewhere where it can escape and take off and not uh, <laughs> take over everything else. Um, as we said before, make sure they're getting at least an inch of rain a week. And if they're not, if we go through a period where there isn't a lot of rain, uh, make sure you're in there and doing a deep watering of at least an inch every week yourself. Um, and then I wanna talk briefly about um, some of the diseases that, <laughs> that plague squash. Um, in addition to watching out for the squirrels, like digging them up and making off with your seeds, um, you wanna make sure that you're watching for um, powdery mildew specifically. Um, it looks like, and I think I've got a picture, it looks like white, white fuzz that kind of spreads out on your leaves and your stems and sometimes towards the end of the season when things are flowering, the flowers can even be affected. Um, that's a fungus that is naturally occurring in the soil. Um, it just kind of builds up and is there. So chances are if you had a powdery mildew issue last year, it'll probably come back, but you know, so you can be on top of it. Um, so um, 
uh, watch out for it. Um, common misconception, powdery mildew actually really loves dry leaves, not wet ones. Downy mildew in the early season loves wet leaves. Powdery mildew actually likes dry conditions on the leaves um, and humid air in order to thrive. Um, so make sure you're getting good airflow, make sure your plants are spaced really well. Um, and we'll talk about some methods for how to kind of knock the, uh, we could talk about it now, actually. <laughs> um, in the season, when you see it starting, you can remove some of the leaves that are affected. Uh, make sure you don't put those leaves in the compost pile or just drop them on the soil surface because you're just putting those spores into your compost and into your garden beds. So remove them. Um, even though it pains me to do this, sometimes I will throw them in the trash um, so that I'm removing that material from my space, trying to knock down the spores. Um, and uh, uh, some folks have used um, things like a milk solution or a baking soda solution in order to treat for that um, in the season. Uh, you can Google uh, milk solution. Uh, I kid you not, like like whole milk <laughs> mixed with water in a spray bottle sprayed onto the leaves can help uh, reduce the spread of uh, powdery mildew in the season. And also some people have had um, some success with baking soda. Um, so if you have questions about how to mix or when to apply, you can shoot us an email or maybe we can address it um t is still there yeah can you hear me yeah i can hear you sorry i had an interruption on my internet so i joined in with my phone but um while that's rebooting um would you be able to um share your screen it's going to take me a couple seconds for my internet to reboot got it so if you just hit uh screen share Let's see. sorry guys had a little technical glitch there <laughs> All of a sudden, my all of a sudden my computer just froze. I am not able to share. It says that I can't. Okay. Well, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. My my computer is just rebooting right now. Okay. Um, are you able to see those? There was one about planting. Um, there was one about planting things in addition to the squash plant, like while the squash are growing. Got it. Um, making use of your space. And then Fatima just asked a question as well. About trellising? Is that the question too? Yeah, there's a few questions if you want to just answer those while I log back on. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, it takes a while for squash to take off. Um, so one thing we did here at KGD Farm is uh, uh, actually do the weather and kind of time restrictions. Um, we planted quick crops uh, with our uh, squash seeds a week ago. So we took head lettuce transplants that were already started, something that's only gonna take, you know, within 30 days to, to come up and then you can harvest it. So yes, um, things like head lettuce or uh, salad mixes, um, something that is, you know, roughly in the window of like 30 to 40 days, you can get in and get out before the squash overwhelms. So yes, that is something that we do. Um, I wouldn't plant something that's going to be in there for a long season because it's just going to get swamped um, quickly um, in July and August. Um, but yeah, quick crops, definitely you can intercrop with. Um, radishes would be another thing. Um, and then in terms of trellising, oh man, I know that Lola talked about trellising, uh, what was it, last week? Wednesday. 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 Um, we were talking about trellising here at KGD Farm. Yes, if you're um, if you're really good at it, go for it. Um, you can grow squash vertically. It takes some training to do that. Um, but yes, you can. Um, you can use deer fencing. Um, tomato cages really don't cut it, in my opinion. But um, if you have something uh, beefy, you got to think about how heavy the squash is going to be. Um, but for winter squash and the squash that vine, yes, you can definitely do um, squash up something. Um, 
uh, a, you know, some sort of like arbor I've seen, which is pretty cool. Um, you're going to have to train them early on when they're small. And then you're going to have to provide support specifically for the fruit while it's growing. Um, I've seen people use those um, net bags that onions come in in the grocery store, which is pretty cool. You don't want to put them in plastic bags, obviously, because you need good airflow. Um, uh, so you can use like the, the onion net bags um, to make like a sling to kind of like attach them to your trellising as they grow and get bigger. Um, and <laughs> I have used in the past uh, pantyhose um, to make slings. You can get them in like those little like plastic eggs at like, you know, the dollar store. Um, and that's a good kind of like farm hack uh, for slinging your growing squash up a vertical trellis. Uh, uh, somebody please do that and share pictures. Uh, I'd love to talk more about how that works for you. But yeah, pantyhose. Um, uh, what other questions did we have? Um, let's see. T, did I get to them? All I'm looking through. Yep, and I should be on in one second with the PowerPoint, <laughs> sorry. Let's see. Ah, when when butter squash, <laughs> I see butter squash taking over uh, your whole backyard. Yes, <laughs> it will. Uh, those, um, if they're well watered and well supported, and you've mixed compost in, and they've got you know high fertility um, and lots of nitrogen, uh, those squash will take over. Um, my my squash plants were twelve feet long by the end of the season. Um, I got a lot of squash off of it, but that's something that you definitely have to plan for, um, especially if you've got a smaller garden or your container gardening or you're on a patio, um, the squash are gonna go all over the place and you can kind of pick them up and redirect them as they grow. Um, but yes, they will take over. Um, and you can try and force them up a fence, like chain link fence, um, get creative. Let's see. I see cattle panels from Tractor Supply. Yep, pantyhose, all of these things. Um, and how do you prevent squash from getting stolen by animals? Um, I have cats and they're very helpful. I have farm cats, um, not here at KGD Farm, but at my personal farm, uh, I have cats. They're very helpful. Um, but I have had some success with um, using straw and hay to kind of hide them I mean, they can still smell the squash, um, but maybe you'll have some luck kind of like protecting them with cover. Um, and if you have friends with cats or dogs, sometimes you can like, hey, can I like get like, you know, like cat hair? <laughs> and you can kind of like sprinkle that around and maybe that works for you. Um, but there are some deterrents you can use like that to kind of like make the area smell like cats or dogs have been around uh, to try and trick animals. But in general, plant more than you need so that when some of it walks away or some of it gets eaten, you still have some for yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, with watermelons and things, I found that my, my neighbors are actually <laughs> more likely to take uh, some of my uh, fruits right right as they're, you know, like being ready to get eaten. Um, so if people can't see them because they're covered in straw, sometimes that helps. Cool. Ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> You're back. I am, I'm back, I'm back. Awesome. Let me figure it out. Okay, I think you're on, Q are you on Q? Let's move to, yeah, let's move to, um, so I've got a, we had a slide that is powdery mildew, just so people see it. Yeah. Powdery mildew looks like that. Yeah, and I'm on there. Downy mildew, that's more of a like early season issue. Uh-oh. Got it? Yep. You guys are going to be watching for powdery mildew. And then let's talk about beans. Cool. So we gave you a variety of beans. 
So we'll talk about these guys. Um, your black eyed peas and your bush beans are bush beans. Um, so no trellis needed on those. Um, you're gonna plant your pole beans uh, or your bush beans, sorry, four to six inches apart in rows 18 inches apart. You gotta think again about the mature plant size. Um, so I know somebody asked the question about what grows well in containers. Um, I would say your winter squash and your summer squash, if you have a big, big container, something that, you know, is at least like this, if that makes sense, you could probably put one squash plant in it. But an even better candidate for uh, container gardening would be your pole beans and maybe your bush beans. But I'll talk about pole beans in a sec. With bush beans, four to six inches apart in rows 18 inches apart, so give them a lot of space. Um, your pole beans, if they're in a container, are awesome because you can move them to your chain link fence or your arbor um, and then have like a, you know, a trellis system that's like already in place. Um, uh, you're going to uh, need at least like five or six vertical feet for your pole beans to thrive. Um, so make sure you're not just giving them like a little trellis, make sure you're giving them a lot of trellis for a longer harvest. Um, uh, and I recommend that you uh, plant your beans in the ground and put your trellis up on the same day. Uh, this is mostly a reminder for myself. I tend to let the plants go for way too long before I add my trellis. And then I have to kind of like help them find it. So planting and trellis same day or, you know, in a short time frame. Um, and specific note about your black eyed peas. Um, you can uh, harvest them either as snap beans uh, when they're immature and green and eat them that way, or you can uh, harvest them after the pod has dried um, as a, uh, a late season dry bean. So you've got some options there, uh, depending on how you want to cook with them. Um, and uh, it's important to note with your pole beans that um, you want to pick them um, when they're small and before the pod has filled out and has obvious beans in it um, for better flavor and a continuous supply of beans. Um, the more you pick beans, the more beans you get. Um, so those are my two notes there. Um, with these guys and everything, I'm gonna say it a million times, inch of water a week. And if we're not getting that in rain, make sure that you're going out there and watering your plants deeply um, so that they have all the water that they need. Any questions about that tea? Oh, a note. Some of you guys got yard long beans. Um, yard long beans um, are really delicious. <laughs> Best uh, harvested when they're immature and not filled out like everything else. Um, and the bean itself is really, really long, like up to a yard long. Like they're not kidding with the name. So those guys need definitely a big trellis because the bean itself is super long and they can start early on the plant. And if the bean, you know, starts to form when it's close to the soil, they end up like curling around and they kind of get small. So make sure since the bean is really big that they have a lot of space, you need a big trellis for them. Okay, I don't see any questions. I I think I lost some of the commentary when I got logged out, but I think we'll just keep going and feel free to throw yeah. any questions in the chat there. Let's do cucumbers. Cucumbers, you can also grow them in a container garden and move them to your trellising or support system. So you could, you don't have to trellis cucumbers, but it's a good, uh, another good candidate for trellising um, because they'll grow vertically um, if you train them. So. Um, spacing is important, uh, two seeds per mound, 18 inches apart, um, similar to your, uh, your summer squash spacing. Um, they will also take over, so make sure that um, you're not planting anything too close um, that's going to be there for a long time um, because they will be swamped by cucumbers. Um, same deal, one inch of rain um, a week. Um, 
make sure that you are harvesting them regularly um, and when they haven't formed these like I call them like the the blimp <laughs> cucumber uh, make sure that um, you're harvesting them by you know twisting them off the vine or cutting them um, when the plant still kind of like if I were to take a slice still kind of looks vaguely triangular like a cross section when they fill out like this um, they're full of water their flavor isn't great and you get really big seeds in there so they shouldn't be like this they should look like kind of almost a triangle still um, in a cross section if that makes sense that's when they're you know they taste amazing <laughs> um, uh, let's see um, with as with the squash, make sure you're watching out for powdery mildew um, towards the middle of the summer. Remove leaves or maybe try a milk solution um, or a baking soda solution sprayed on it to kind of control it. Um, and uh, also watch out for cucumber beetles, which are the next slide. So these buggers, um, you'll see them all over the place. Pretty common pest. Um, there aren't great controls for cucumber beetle. Um, they attack all parts of the plant. Um, and when the plant is young, they can, uh, um, attack the plant to the point where they kind of like inhibit growth. Um, so, um, if you only have a couple cucumber plants, um, it's best to, my recommendation is to go out and either like smish them to stay on top of the numbers. Um, or knock them off or drop them into a cup of water, you know, with a little bit of soap in it. But mechanical removal of cucumber beetles and just watching them uh, is probably your best bet. Um, there are other methods like using um, organic certified, you know, pest controls like um, soaps and whatnot. But if you only have a couple plants, like probably just going out and picking them and dumping them into a cup of water um, is your best bet for staying on top of them. I wanted to note if, um, if you have raised your hand, uh, that function gives me an um, opportunity to unmute you and ask your question live. Um, we'll hold those questions to the end, um, but if you have a question, please throw in the chat box. Um, and if you're unable to use the chat box, maybe you called in or something like that, um, we'll try to unmute you toward the end. We'll have a little chat with uh, with Molly afterwards. Um, okay. Cool. cool. So Callaloo. Um, Callaloo is a green in the, am it's an amaranth. Um, and uh, this is only my second year growing it um, as a like an edible. Um, I have grown it as a like a cut flower for a long time. So um, using it in this way is a little bit new to me, actually. So I have a feeling there are a lot of you who are more familiar with this plant than I am, um, which is cool. Um, Callaloo has uh, tiny, teeny, tiny seeds, um, but you still want to be uh, spacing your planting, spacing your seeds appropriately. Um, so we recommend that you sow, it's really hard to do, um, but you sow uh, like one seed every inch about a quarter to a half inch deep. Um, and you can, I've had some success with sowing them and once they germinate, going back and gently kind of picking plants out that are too close together and moving them so that you get more plants. Um, but just be very, very gentle when you do that. Um, but so one inch um, apart and only about a quarter to a half inch deep. Um, and then thin them so that there's at least uh, 12 inches in between them um, so that they can grow. Um, the mature plant will grow to roughly three to four feet tall. Um, and you wanna harvest young leaves regularly um, throughout the season for um, stewing and eating. Um, it's a really delicious, <laughs> delicious plant. Um, and I encourage you, so if you have a bunch of plants and they're thriving, um, reserve the bulk of them for what you're gonna eat during the season um, and then keep a couple plants um, there and let them go. Let them, let them grow all the way to maturity so that you get um, the big seed head on top 
Um, and then uh, once the seed head matures at the end of the season, sort of fall-ish, uh, dry it and then uh, thresh it so that you can keep all of the seeds. They make a lot of seeds. Um, amaranth is also grown as a grain. So um, uh, you make a lot of seeds um, and then you can keep those and store those or cook with them uh, over the uh, fall, winter and then have them for the spring. I found too that um, despite my best efforts, amaranth, you're always gonna drop a bunch of seeds in the garden. So they have a tendency to self sow. So watch out for them. If you grow it this year in your garden and you let some of those um, flower and seed heads form, watch out, out for it in the same place next season because you're probably going to get volunteers, which is pretty cool. Hey, Molly, I had a quick question. Um, actually, it's on the, from the last slide. Uh, does diatomaceous earth you, uh, work for the uh, cucumber beetles or not? Nah? Uh, it can, and flea beetles. Yep, it can control them as they're coming out of the soil. Um, by um, uh, scraping and scarring um, their little bodies. <laughs> Brutal. Um, but yes, yeah. you can use diatomaceous earth. Yep. Okay, you ready to go to the next slide? Yeah. Cool, flowers. My favorite. All sorts of flowers here. Um, so flowers are given to you guys um, because they work in partnership with the rest of your vegetables. Um, they're a great way to, even though you, you only eat some of them, uh, they're a great way to call pollinators in as like a beacon, like, hey, we have fruiting crops here. So um, they call the bees to your yard. Um, so they're great for mixing into your gardens. Um, and zinnias and cosmos make excellent cut flowers. So for all of you market gardeners, um, it's another way to add to your market offerings. Um, so their uh, planting needs are different and I'm gonna like breeze through them fairly quickly because again, all that information is available in your planting guidelines document on the KGD website. Um, so flower uh, zinnias, two seeds every 12 to 16 inches. Um, if you're gonna grow them for cut flowers, air on the side of more like 16 inches than 12. Um, so that the plants um, can grow big with really long stems. Um, they grow to four feet tall, for, so don't plant them in the front of your garden, plant them towards the back because they're big plants and they'll shade, um, and cut regularly for a continuous, uh, uh, a long window of blooming. Um, Cosmos, basically the same deal. You can put them a little bit closer together. They're not as, sometimes they're not as branchy. Um, if you're growing from cut flowers, give them more space so that they branch. Um, two seeds every six inches. Marigolds, two seeds every six to 12 inches, six inches, thinning them out to one every 12 inches once they've established. Um, and with marigolds, don't forget to pop the dead marigold heads off, just pinch them off or deadhead them um, so that you get a continuous supply of marigolds throughout the season. Also, marigolds are edible, which leads me to my next and last one, which is nasturtiums, which are also edible. Um, you can eat the leaves and you can eat the flowers when they form. Um, plant two or three seeds um, every 12, to, I want to say 12, but you can do six inches apart. I like to put these right on the edge of my beds because they're a shorter plant. Um, and uh, I don't, they get, tend to get buried in and amongst other things. And some of the ones that we gave you have a tendency to trail so they look really good on the edge of your container garden and they look really good and, and are happy on the edge of your um, raised beds. Um, so that's where I put them. They also act as a, what's called a trap crop. So um, they, uh, aphids, if they're on the front of your garden, if you have an aphid issue, they tend to catch aphids and hold them there which provides a little bit of a barrier between them and something else that also gets aphids, like your tomatoes um, or your peppers. So if you plant almost like a, like a windrow of uh, nasturtiums, there's like a barrier around your tomatoes, um, aphids aren't very sophisticated. They'll blow in, hit your nasturtium plants first, and maybe not make it past, or maybe just stay put in your nasturtiums. So it's one way that you can use another edible plant to protect one of your like 
very precious tomato plants or pepper plants um, in an interesting way. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to talk about aphids uh, a little bit later or yes. I was just wondering if you want to pause and talk a little bit about that? I can. I can do it now. I can do it later. I think we, uh, we talk about them after I talk about your transplants. So maybe okay. if you want to hold your questions, there's a slide devoted to them. Um, okay, great. But yes, because I'll bet some of you have aphids. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we do too. <laughs> it's a, it was a bad year for all pests. It's going to be a bad year for pests. <laughs> Hot weather transplants. We started your GRP transplants in March, some of them in February, some of them in January. So they've been growing for quite some time. Um, and we do that so that we can uh, have them large and ready to go so that you get a sustained harvest over our short Michigan summer. Um, and they're all ready to plant now past our um, last frost date. So I'm actually going to jump right into the next slide. So let's talk about the nightshade family. Oh boy. <laughs> so you guys probably picked up something like this or for non-GRP members or our folks that are outside Detroit. Um, you got these at a nursery or grew them yourself. Um, you can start these guys six to eight weeks before your last frost day uh, inside and that's exactly what we did and this is what they look like. Um, this is my favorite kind of thing to plant. Um, everything in this family is what we call a heavy feeder. They, uh, the bigger the fruit, the more they need in terms of fertility in order to grow those fruits. So with everything I'm going to be talking about, we encourage you to mix compost um, into the soil as you're planting um, to boost uh, the nutrient content of the soil. Um, and you might want to think about feeding them um, with some sort of uh, uh, plant food, um, you know, some sustainable plant food. Um, I've used, for example, Neptune's harvest um, through the season or at intervals um, around, around the fruiting time um, so that the plant is well supported in making big, delicious uh, tomatoes and peppers for you. Um, you want to plant them, uh, tomatoes specifically, uh, two feet apart um, in rows that are three feet apart. Um, and you wanna make sure that uh, you're trellising them well um, because they get really heavy with fruit um, towards the end of the season. And if you're really good at trellising, you know that uh, the vines can reach seven to eight, sometimes nine feet tall by the end of the season. So give them a lot of space and support. Um, you also wanna make sure that you are um, suckering the plants. And I don't have a good example here, but after this, we can go look in uh, the KGD greenhouse and I can show you um, how we're suckering them. Um, uh, but when planting your tomatoes, this guy's really, really tall. Um, and I can see that there's an aphid on it. So do you want to scoot over and I'll like, sh I can do a demo on how to plant them if you want. I think so. I think we're going to switch, switch our video over to you if that's okay. Gotcha. Let's see. Sorry, guys, I'm going to mobile mode. Now you can see me in two places. Cool. T, can you hear me okay? Can you still hear me? How about now? <laughs> I am on mute. That was crazy. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Got it. Cool. cool. Okay. So real quick, I want to show people. Can you see me okay? You can tell me if I'm in frame. I can't see myself anymore. Um, good <laughs> technology oh my gosh okay so 
this is what your GRP transplants look like, or a lot of them do, right? So this guy is over uh, 12 inches tall. He's got a little oh, maybe ball. Um, Lola, how about you unmute your camera? I think that would be better, even if it's low. Got it. Okay. Am I still echoing a lot? Yeah. We could use we could use Lola's uh, mic. Okay. Did you mute yours? Yeah, I'm. And Lola, you have to unmute. <laughs> How's that? Let's try it. I think we solved it. Sorry, guys. Okay. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes, and no echo. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Dear, how are we doing? No? We're good, yep. Okay, cool. Okay, can you see this? Oh, are we good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so when you're planting your tomatoes and they're this big, um, one thing you can do with your tomatoes is actually plant a good half of this into the ground. Um, so you can see I just picked off some of these, um, these lower leaves. And you want to make sure that this part is still above ground. But tomatoes um, will grow roots off of their main stem. Um, so if you plant them half in the ground, you're actually going to get way more root growth off of it which is gonna give you a nice, stable, healthy plant um, for the rest of the season. Um, so that's my recommendation to you, is when you get your transplants, your tomato transplants, when you plant them, prep a nice deep hole, mix compost in, and then plant them half in the ground. Pick off the leaves and plant them half in the ground. So instead of planting them way up here, shallow like this, which is like, you know, they're gonna like tip over, dig a really nice deep hole and plant them so that there's just a little bit sticking out like that, about half the plant above the ground. And that's gonna give them a really nice start. Um, and uh, yeah, that root mass is gonna support them better through the season. And of course, water them in and give them a nice spacing. Um, so if this is my container garden, I might plant only like one tomato in the middle and like put some stuff, or put some other plants around the outside, like nasturtiums or another pepper but you don't wanna to put too many tomatoes close together. Um, and also as the tomato grows up, it's gonna to want to uh, grow side shoots. Um, my recommendation to you is to pinch off those side shoots. Um, not all of them, you want basically like one big tomato vine coming up and maybe two vines coming off of that, but no more. So you can have and some people know that like tomatoes get big and bushy. Um, you can either have a big bushy plant with lots of vines and smaller fruit, or you can sucker it and have a few vines with big fruit. Um, so the more you sucker, the more, the bigger the fruit and the more fruit you end up getting. If that makes sense, it's a trade off. So that's how you do your tomatoes. Yeah, um, there was a question up front, uh, up a little bit up um, from Leslie. She says she um, she ran out of space. She put the tomatoes too close together. Um, she's thinking about transplanting to another area. Is that a good idea? After she's um, already planted, is that cool? So I just transitioned back. <laughs> can oh, you hear me okay? I can hear you, yep. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, so I there you go, boom. <laughs> Cool. I see you on Lola's uh, audio, uh, video. Oh, now you're on both. I'm there back. you are. <laughs> <laughs> the next time we do this, we're going to be like so good with the <laughs> um, Next time, it's it's all me. That I have no idea what I'm doing. With <laughs> but, um, so if they're already established and they're really close together, uh, 
depends on how long they've been in the ground for, but um, you just want to make sure you don't pull up, like, like take the soil with it so that you're doing the least amount of damage to the roots. Um, so don't just like try and pull it up like it's small. Now you want to take a good amount of soil around it um, and pick that up, prep a much bigger hole and then water it in really well. You don't want to shock the roots too much because now the roots are probably quite a bit bigger than they were when you planted it. So yes, you can just be mindful of how much bigger the roots are. Great tips. Yep. I just did that with some strawberries. Boom. Yep. <laughs> cool. I'm going to put my PPE back on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, um, I'm on night, still on nightshades or you want me to keep going? Yeah. Peppers, 18 inches apart. You do not sink peppers into the ground. Um, so plant them at, you know, root level. So this is your plant. You're going to like match that level here. Get rid of any yellowing leaves. Um, and also, if you got stuff from us with flowers, pinch their flowers off. We want them to focus on their efforts on growing out big roots. And if they're focused on flowers, they will not do that. So um, we have to trick the plant into thinking that um, it's younger than it is. Um, so pinch the flowers off before you plant it. And also, I don't know if you can see this, but do you see how those roots are all kind of like bound up in there um, as I get soil all over my keyboard? Um, give the roots, not a ton, but give them a little pinch maybe to loosen them up a little bit. Um, that's going to send the message to the plant that, oh shoot, something happened to my roots and it's going to focus its efforts on creating more roots right after it's planted and that's what you want. So loosen it up a little bit. Don't, you know, mangle, but um, before you plant, do that. Again, mix compost in um, 18 inches apart, 16 inches, I think, apart from the next pepper plant and you're good to go. Okay, just let's pause for a little technical thing. Help me out, guys. When we switch screens, um, I have to go on the back and make sure. I, I don't think they saw your, um, when you pulled that, when you saw that root bomb. Can you guys see Molly right now? Can somebody let me know in the chat box? Okay. Okay, Annie says it's good. Okay. So Dorian, if you're on a phone, maybe um, swipe over or, or adjust your gallery view. No Molly. Hmm. Some folks there are two. There are two Mollies right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I think. Um, okay, how does that work? She is back. Okay, great. I'm back. <laughs> All right, now are you on the nightshade slide? I'm sorry, we got a little bit thrown off there. Yep, nightshade slide. Okay, boom. Let's go. Cool. Eggplant. That's a big plant. Make sure that you are planting them 18 to 24 inches apart. That plant will be, um, especially the black king eggplant, somewhere between two and a half, three feet tall by two feet. If they're getting a, you know, all their water and you've mixed compost in, that's a big plant. So make sure that um, uh, you're giving them a lot of space. Uh, and tomatillos. Um, tomatillos, I've had really good luck uh, putting in tomato cages. They tend to have this kind of like sprawling habit um, that likes to kind of like flop over and get wild. So uh, think about maybe using a tomato cage on your tomatillos. Um, and again, 18 inches apart for those guys, um, they do get kind of wild um, <laughs> um, and benefit from having some supports. Um, ground cherries. I'm experimenting this year with ground cherries at home. So. Ground cherries, um, they kind of have this like sprawling low habit and the fruit, um, the, the little like husk cherries that form are really hard to see because they're like underneath the plant and the plant forms this almost like dense umbrella of foliage. So this year I'm putting my ground cherries in hanging baskets that like, you know, I bought a million years ago. Um, and uh, as long as they're well watered, my, uh, my theory is that um, I'll be able to get under the plant and see the little like ground cherries better. Stay tuned. I'll let you know how that goes. Um, but ground cherries, um, 
uh, they can get big and their fruit is hard to find. Um, so uh, you want, um, what did I say, 18 inches apart um, uh, because they do, they do spread out a little bit. Um, all of these plants have common pest and disease issues. Um, aphids, absolutely. Um, potato beetle, a very colorful uh, yellow and orange and black striped beetle. Um, and of course, blight, um, which tends to hit us towards the end of the season. Um, so watch out for those things. Um, potato beetles, grow, um, they lay um, really dark, like kind of like bright, like orange clusters of eggs underneath the, um, the leaves of your potatoes and they'll spread over to other nightshades um, if given the opportunity. So I like to go in once a week, flip the leaves over and see if I can find the eggs and just smish them before they're able to get established. Um, uh, blight is something that you have to watch out for. It looks like, um, like an oil slick on older leaves towards the end of the season. The best way to get on top of it is to be vigilant um, and remove the leaves when you see it and put them right into the trash. Don't put them in the compost, but that's kind of a late season uh, issue. Um, and then aphids. <laughs> we, had a, <laughs> la, la, la. <laughs> we had a mild, we had a mild, we keep getting milder and milder winters, which means that we're not getting the overwinter kill that we used to with common pest issues. So we're seeing them earlier. We're seeing them more aggressive. Um, this is just something that we're going to have to stay on top of um, for the foreseeable future <laughs> as everything warms. <laughs> um, so let's see, is it the next slide? It isn't. So maybe, T, should we talk about aphids now? Should we skip uh, around? Sure, it's up to you. Cool. I'm on the cucurbit slide if you want to take a moment to talk about that. Yeah. So aphids, let's talk because I know that you guys inherited a problem, right? Um, and it's something that um, we all have. Um, I have at home with my stuff that I grew myself. Um, so aphids are a pain in the butt, but they're not terribly sophisticated organisms. Um, so there are some, uh, depending on how bad the situation is, there are three approaches, mechanical, cultural, mechanical, and then like the nuclear effort, which is like to actually get in there and spray or add some sort of like insect, mild, but insecticide uh, into your, your growing habit. So cultural um, is to keep your gardens as weed free as possible, remove leaf litter um, in places that can harbor insects um, in terms of culture, also appropriate spacing so when I said they aren't sophisticated, aphids either walk across or get blown from plant to plant. They're not great at flying. The ones that do have wings just kind of like get blown. Um, so if you're practicing like good plant spacing, you're rotating your crops so that the tomatoes aren't being grown in the same spot year after year. Um, so that the pests come right back out and like their favorite food is they're waiting for them year after year. Um, and if you're keeping your garden like well cleaned, you're using clean gloves, you're not like brushing up against, you know, an infected plant and then brushing up against a non-infected plant. So you're like brushing them off of your pants or your shirts. Um, that's going to help you out in the long run. So being mindful of your growing culture is helpful. Um, and in terms of mechanical interventions, um, when the plants are small and your problem is small, like I have one tomato plant in a raised bed, you can, I mean, for the people, you know, maybe you're squeamish, um, but like you can go and you can actually squish them. If you're seeing a couple, go squish them when you see them coming up. It's not gonna get rid of the eggs or anything that's hard to see, but you can squish the adults and maybe stay on top of the numbers. With aphids, we're really talking about management. We're not talking about eradication. We're not going for perfection here. So it's all about maintaining their numbers low enough um, so that it's not impacting the plant's growth. Um, so it's about 
It's not about perfection. You're not going to get rid of aphids. You're just going to knock their numbers down to the point where it's manageable and the plants are happy. Um, uh -huh. So mechanical, another mechanical intervention um, is you can go in there when the plants are bigger and established um, and you can with like a with your watering wand or your, your hose breaker, go in and spray them off. Um, that'll knock their numbers down. Aphids aren't, again, very sophisticated. They have a really hard time finding uh, your plant again, especially if the plant is bigger. If you knock them off onto the soil, some of them might find a way to crawl back on, but chances are a lot of them aren't ever gonna make it back onto the plant. So you can just go in and spray with water periodically to keep on top of it. Um, and then nuclear effort, right? For our market gardeners and folks at home who have major plantings and you can't go in and squish them and whatever. Oh man. <laughs> so um, then we're gonna talk about um, briefly, and this is something that like like if you have a question about some of these um, these interventions, you can shoot me an email um, uh, because I really want, I would need to have more information about how you're growing in order to give you a good recommendation. But just so it's on your radar, um, you can use um, insecticidal soaps. This one is OMRI certified. So it is an organic uh, environmentally safe product called Safer Insect Killing Soap. It's for um, soft bodied insects like aphids. Um, and then this is neem oil. Uh, it is a, a natural um, insecticide. Um, uh, and you dilute both of these and spray it topically onto the, the, or the pests themselves um, in order to um, kill them uh, when applied at appropriate intervals and at the right time. Uh, it doesn't hurt the plant. But again, those are all details that are specific to what you're growing, how much of it, and um, uh, which product you go for. Um, so email, shoot me an email if you have questions about how to apply those things. Um, for aphids, some folks um, have used uh, home remedies. Um, for example, you don't have to buy the fancy soap, but some people um, have used um, uh, like dish soaps, like like a gentle one, seventh generation or dawn in a, in a solution and sprayed onto it um, in order to uh, knock down their numbers. But again, those are like, there's a, there's a right way to mix it. There's a right way to apply it. And then there's a right interval um, so that you're not harming the plant. Um, because yeah, you want to be mindful of that um, uh, when, you're, when you're going to this kind of pest control. Um, Make sense? Yeah, that was a great, great explanation. Any other questions about aphids? Yeah. So many. Um, yeah, there was a quick question about um, planting um, marigolds and nasturtiums with your nightshades. How you feel about that? Um, I have. Is the question whether or not they like hurt or whether they're not like good uh, partners? Uh, uh, is it recommended is the question if, um, if there's clarity? Yeah, um, so uh, you don't get good, you don't get tomatoes without pollination. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, having flowers around is a good idea. Um, and uh, you can plant them at, you know, at and around the feet of your tomatoes and peppers. Um, I, in general, highly recommend that you uh, intercrop um, uh, your, uh, your flower varieties around your heavy feeders, um, especially your squash, um, so that you get good pollination. Definitely. Nice. I think we can go to cucurbits. Let's do it. Cool. Just like your winter squash, um, your watermelon is going to take off in a direction and create a watermelon probably eight or nine feet away from where you planted it. So keep in mind the, uh, the size of the mature plant um, and plant again, two or three seeds, no, definitely not one seed in a mound spaced 18 to 24 inches apart. They need a lot of space, their root ball 
is basketball sized or greater. So like think about the mature plant, but also think about the amount of roots it takes for that plant to, to support itself. And then picture that like basketball plus in the ground. So you gotta like visualize. And that's how much space that root mass meat needs. That's why it's two feet apart from its, uh, its nearest neighbor. Um, uh, as with the other, you know, the, the um, squash, you're gonna be watching for um, powdery mildew and uh, those yellow and black squash beetles, cucumber beetles, um, removing them, squashing them, keeping on top of numbers, when the plant is small, again, diatomaceous earth can be helpful to keep, you know, the, the beetles numbers down. Um, and I think my biggest note, I, d I wanted to talk for two seconds about, this is the biggest question, when do you harvest a watermelon is the question that I get because it's like you've waited, you know, 90 days to get there. Um, right. if, it, if your neighbor or if like a squirrel didn't already walk off with it, they're like these precious things. <laughs> um, so try and hide it with straw over the season. Don't cover completely, but kind of like mask it with like piles of leaves or straw. Um, and then when you get to that point where you're like, that is a beautiful melon, uh, three things that I use, and you're still gonna mess it up every once in a while. So plant lots of watermelon because you're still gonna open one up before it's ripe. It happens. Um, but number one, you're looking at the spot where the watermelon contacts the soil, the spot. That, as the watermelon ripens, turns from whitish green to like a bright yellow. So you got to kind of like peek underneath it to see if that is turning yellow. That's a good indicator that the, the melon is starting to or is ripe. And this goes for the grocery store ones too. When you see the melon with the spot that's, ye that's bright yellow, good chance it's ripe and has a lot of sugar in it. Um, the tendril. So if you look at where the melon connects to the vine, there will be a leaf and right at the base of the leaf, there will be a little curly cue, a tendril that helped that vine kind of like sink itself into either the trellis you put it up or the, the ground so that it's stabilized. When that tendril is brown and shriveled, that's another indicator that it's ripe. And then third, and this one is more, <laughs> way more nuanced. Um, you wanna give it a good knock or a thump with your finger and listen to it, almost like you put like a seashell next to your head, listen to it. Um, when that sound goes from like a high, like metallic kind of like tink um, to a more hollow sounding like thunk, like hollow, um, that means that it's ripe and everyone I ask has a different uh, <laughs> different description of what that sound is, but you're going from a high sound to a low thud or hollow sound. <laughs> and that's a good indicator, but <laughs> you know, you're still gonna have one open that's probably not ripe, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, that's the best I can give you. Um, uh, Okay, summer squash. I think we already kind of covered it, but um, the summer squash we gave you, the zucchinis are big and they form a big bush, you know, two to three feet tall by two to three feet wide. So plant them at least two feet apart, put two or three seeds in that mound, an inch of rain a week or hand water them. And then my recommendation is to harvest them small. Um, the bigger they get, the more kind of like fibrous they get. And then we're talking like, instead of fresh eating, we're talking about zucchini bread. Uh, and we are all tired of zucchini bread by late August, September, like I am done. So harvest them small when they're tender. Um, don't, but there's always gonna be one that ends up, you know, two feet long and, and you know, rock solid. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you saw that question from Sean. Uh, hey, Sean, uh, he was wondering, you know, that yellow spot you're talking about with the watermelon? Yep. Does that form if you're tre if you're using trellises and, and the hoses like you talked about, or is that just forming when you're when it's laying on the ground? When it's laying on the ground, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to rely on the other two. Um, that spot forms because um, it's not 
producing chlorophyll on the bottom. Um, so you don't get the third, <laughs> you don't get the advantage of having three things to look for if you're, if you're um, doing vertical harvesting um, uh, has been my perspective, yeah. And also if your melons got rotated, that spot may be really small um, while it was growing or big, um, it depends. So you may or may not have that spot depending on how you're growing the melon. Really great mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. You want to show them this picture of the hornworm? Absolutely. Cutie um, pie. What's that? Kind of cute. <laughs> they are awful. <laughs> they are cute though. Uh, the moth is really impressive. You tend to not see it because it's only out at night, but you will hear this guy. Um, the bigger they get, they'll sound a warning. The big hornworms will make a clicking noise. And if you get too close, they'll actually rear up and start clicking at you. So if you've got really good ears, you can sometimes hear them before you see them um, because they're really good at blending in. So hornworms, if you've grown a lot of tomatoes, uh, you know that they have the ability to eat half your plant overnight. Um, so you wanna be super diligent. Um, you wanna make sure that you can use diatomaceous earth to try and control them um, when they, they come up out of the ground. Um, but uh, largely it's about getting good at scouting them when they're little. Um, and then I walk around my tomato patch with a bucket of water with soap in it or not. I'm pretty brutal or I pick them off and throw them on the ground and stomp them. Um, you just have to be super diligent because they will eat the stem, the leaf and the fruit. They love green tomatoes. So be mindful. Um, Someone said that they bite. They don't really bite, but they are, you know, three to four inches big and as, you know, thick as my thumb. Um, so they're intimidating. Uh, don't be intimidated. Go get them. Because <laughs> um, they're, they're bad guys. Um, so be on the lookout. <laughs> Flea beetles. Next slide. Uh, again, like with the cucumber beetle, diatomaceous earth can help. Um, flea beetles are jumpers though. Um, and uh, you know, with cold season crops, sometimes when it's, the, it's colder, I wouldn't recommend doing this now, but you can put row cover over your cold season crops um, to prevent them from jumping into your plants. That's not effective now because it's really too hot to be covering your plants too much. Um, so maybe diatomaceous earth and making sure that your plants are spaced appropriately um, is your best bet. And we've already talked about aphids. This picture gives me great anxiety. So <laughs> I'm going to move past. <laughs> oh, actually, no, I have to move back. I have to, if we can go. I was, I was hoping there was an option. Or, there's a beneficial, um, there's a little beneficial wasp um, that parasitizes aphids. You'll see what we call the mummies um, on your plants. They look like little bloated brown, uh, they're the, the shell of the aphid. Um, so you'll see like maybe like a cluster of aphids. If you see like a little like brown ball, it's a husk, um, that aphid had been parasitized by uh, a beneficial uh, wasp. Um, and that means that they're active in their garden, your garden, and they're working with you. So when you see those, say like, oh, thanks, because those are, uh, those are natural uh, beneficial insects working alongside you in your garden. So just like something to note. There isn't actually a picture of them here. And we've already talked about pests. So herbs, Cool. Parsley. Amazing. Um, you can eat the whole thing. Make sure that they're spaced. Um, we say, yeah, 12 to 18 inches apart, more like 12 inches apart. Um, uh, this is all about, since you eat the whole plant and like technically like this is ready to be eaten today, uh, my recommendation to you is to exercise some self-control and wait until this plant has doubled in size to start harvesting off of it. 
um, that's going to give it uh, the opportunity to establish well um, before like you start taking uh, the sustaining parts of the plant off to use in dishes. Um, so yeah, um, and I found too that we our mild winters mean that some of my parsley is coming back season after season. So at the end of the season, if you mulch it and keep it warm, uh, chances are one of those plants might come back in the spring, which is pretty cool. And for your basil, um, 12 inches apart, um, allow again the plant to double in size before you start taking uh, plants off of it. And also, once it's gotten big, um, pinch the top most leaves off. So once it's like, you know, they're here right now, once they've got like four or six sets of leaves on them, pinch that middle stem off, which is going to encourage the plant to send out side shoots. So you can get like one stalk with like a couple leaves, or you can pinch it and you can get many stalks with many leaves. So you're gonna get a bushier, branchier plant and more basil off of it. So uh, make sure you're cutting that off once it has roughly six, six eight sets of leaves on it for more, uh, for more basil. Also harvest it in the morning because by the afternoon, the flavor of the basil has gotten a little bitter. So if you harvest it in the morning, when it's like juicy and full of water, you'll get better tasting basil. Um, and also watch for the flavor uh, to change once it goes into flowering phase. It shifts a little bit. Um, let me know how that goes. Let me know how it changes. Questions? Um, question on um, diatomaceous earth, uh, food grade versus what we're using at the farm. Um, food grade. You're, yep. using, you're using food, the food grade on the farm. I have. I think that's the only stuff I have used is food grade. But if you've got a specific, yeah, if you have a specific question about diatomaceous earth and applications, maybe like shoot me uh, an email, which is on your screen. Okay, um, so we're right at the end here. Um, we've taken a little bit of time here, but if you have any final questions, I just wanted to hang out with Molly and if there's some questions about either the garden research program or the slides here, uh, let's try to get through those. And um, for folks who need to jump off, we totally understand. We're just gonna hang out for a minute. Uh, quick minute if you have it, Molly. Let's yeah. look at some of these questions. Um, uh, okay, so chives, they're bushy and they're starting to flower, but they haven't opened up yet. Um, can you give some recommendations? On how to eat them? Oh, on harvesting or care. Okay, you, can eat, you can eat all of that. Um, okay. The, the chive blossoms taste like chives. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I sell them with the flowers, with the immature flowers. Um, yeah, um, feel free to experiment with them, but it is, they are all edible. Um, so okay. go for it. Have you ever tried to catch those horn worms at night with a black light? Yes, I question. have. <laughs> okay. Say, my, other half, my other half has. Um, we may or may not have a black light rig <laughs> that we do. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I have had mixed results. I think more effective than the black light uh, has been training my eyes during the daylight to see those like seven white stripes on their bodies really, really well. And to just like train myself to identify like early damage. It tends to be on the tender shoots, like the youngest leaves first, either at the top of the plant or like on those side, uh, the side vines of the plant. Uh, it tends to be on if they are lucky enough to find a cluster of like perfect green tomatoes, one of them chances are is gonna land and just sit there and get fat and eat all your green tomatoes. So like if you're, if you're keying into like where they tend to be and train your eyes they tend to also like to hang off of the bottom of the leaflet and like their heads kind of curl 
and then the leaf because they're heavy they like tend to curl down um so yeah black light go for it like maybe <laughs> i'll experiment with that and you experiment it with it this year and we'll talk about its effectiveness um but uh also just like get really good at just like keying into like where they like to be on the plant and uh those those white stripes on them cool so um sean's asking he says using the hoop covers and um there's like a million tiny little net things Ooh. um should we be worried about that maybe she should he should shoot you an email with some pictures or something on that one pictures would be helpful specific um uh, so Joshua, he's new to growing. He says, what should, should, what should my first crop be? And I'd probably say the thing you like to eat. What would you say? <laughs> I say the same thing. And I think I, I, think I got that line from you. <laughs> so listen to me. Yes. Say, like, if you don't like eating zucchini, like maybe not that one this year. Um, uh, if you really like tomatoes, so like at the with the garden resource program plants if you're a garden resource program member um we tend to uh kind of set you up with the plants that are easiest to grow and that comes from again like years of figuring out like one what do people like to eat but two like what's also kind of like easiest and fastest and has the least amount of like specific needs for their cultivation so um Everything we gave you in the GRP is relatively easy to grow. Um, and then it's really based on like, what's your favorite thing to, what's your favorite dish for August, September and the like. Um, uh, and then what, what's your space look like? So if you're a container gardener or have only one raised bed, um, you want to get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of space. So um, yeah, maybe not all squash. <laughs> Um, okay, and then uh, um, uh, Nava says, uh, can we, should we be proactive and sprinkle diatomaceous earth um, inside the raised bed? Can you talk about that? There's a lot of questions about the diatomaceous earth today. Um, how does it impact your earthworms? Um, you know, how to apply it? Would you mind just speaking on it for a couple minutes? Because uh, there were a couple questions up there about that. Yeah, I can. Um, so, you know, after the plants are a little bit established, sprinkle um, around the plant on the top of the soil. And it works by when the, when the insects come out of the ground um, and walk across it. Um, it. If you look at diatomaceous earth under a microscope, it looks like uh, glass. It's really, really sharp. And so it only works when the, when the bugs come out of the ground um, and walk across it or try and crawl across it to your plants because it, it's, it, it cuts up their little bodies. And that sounds brutal. It is. <laughs> it's brutal, um, which, uh, which hurts them and uh, causes them to, you know, like lose moisture and like not thrive. Um, so that's like the mechanism at play. So you've got to, yeah, again, have it on early. Um, uh, so yeah, like when the plants are small, um, and from the get go, cause yeah, they've, they've got to find the plant, have the signal to find the plant and then walk across it. Um, so if you're spreading diatomaceous earth way far away from your plant, you're, um, not getting the benefit. It's got to like, you know, form like a ring around the plant in order for it to, to, um, help you. Okay. A few people had, um, maybe who called in, had raised their hand, Beth and someone else, maybe Annie, who had called in, raised your hand. Um, I lowered your hand earlier, so if you'd like to, if you'd like to say something or ask a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand again, and I'll allow you to um, talk. Uh, let's, let's go with Betty. Betty, I'm going to push talk. Just go ahead and ask, ask your question, okay? Can you hear us, Betty? Yes. Um, <laughs> Great class, you guys. Uh, just a real quick question. I re last year we were bothered with flea beetles in our garden, and so I read that you should put the ground cover over the eggplants immediately after planting them. So now I'm thinking that maybe I should remove it based on what you just said. 
Ground cover. What kind of ground cover are you using? Well, maybe I'm calling it the wrong. It's that netting that you put over the hoops. Like, oh. you know, yeah. So I put that directly over on top of the freshly planted eggplants. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And that, that kind of, did you have, you had flea beetle issues. Was it in the same spot last season? No, I moved to a different part of the garden. Excellent. Okay. So, um, so well done. Um, so a, a quick note about um, uh, the flea beetle life cycle. They go under the soil over the winter and then they come back up. And if the crops are there in the spring, and if the crops are there, the same crops, their favorite crops, um, amazing. They, they get their favorite food right there. And in that case, covering them in the same spot as last season where you had the issue, basically just creates for them like this beautiful restaurant. Like you've, you've <laughs> put their like food there. You've given them like frost protection. So maybe they came up a little early and like, mm -hmm. you're just like creating like the most beautiful environment for them. Um, but if you moved your spot, you've moved the, the, um, the, uh, the same crop, a different, the crop to a different area. Um, where you didn't have the issue and then you covered it, chances are you've got, you've actually protected them. Um, so well done. Um, yeah, when they're small, you can put reme or floating row cover, that white fabric over them. Um, you want to make sure that it's the, if you're using like the Agrabond, they're different thicknesses. Um, uh, row cover comes in different grades, heavy stuff for like deep winter frost protection and the really gauzy stuff which is thinner for uh more like pest control in the spring and like late spring so make sure that it's the gauzy stuff make sure it's the light stuff um and then when it watch the plants to see if it's getting too hot um because it's not i i say make sure you remove it or maybe don't use it now because the days are so warm that you ha run the risk of maybe cooking your plants a little bit um so it's this like kind of like is it too hot to have the cover still on but like are the plants too small to kind of like get past any potential damage that the the bugs are doing you got to kind of make a judgment call there um uh because once they've found it like if you were to remove it and then the flea beetles find you covering again again just creates like a perfect environment for them to thrive um, so you just got to make a judgment call based on the heat and like whether or not the plants look like they're uh, struggling with too much heat under the reme. Um, so, so if I switch over to uh, diatomaceous earth, how much do you sprinkle around each plant? Just a little bit or? Uh, that's, yeah, it's kind of like you sprinkle it over. You don't want like mounds of it, but yeah, like yeah. a, like a sal like enough of a coating that like they hit it. And um there are better recommendations online i know for like how much um i wish i had like a picture <laughs> yeah. example of like how much but um yeah it's not a light dusting it's like somewhere it's not a heaping but it's like a good coating around your plants okay thanks for hey. your question betty i'm gonna put you back on mute because you're echoing a little bit um annie i did see your your hand raised again. I'm just gonna get through a couple of these in the chat box and come back to you. Uh, random question, can you put pickles in the compost real quick? Pickles in the compost? Will the vinegar hurt anything? Like they've already had vinegar? Yeah. I I am not sure. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that. I, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Vinegar, vinegar, so acidic, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, uh, you still want to, you know, it, it depends on, I, my next follow-up question would be like, how much, how often, um, yeah. like one people, pickle is different than like the pickles from the, the factory yeah. <laughs> going into your compost pile. Yeah. So, exactly. okay, we'll do a little research and maybe, um, uh, the person who asked that question can email us if there's some specific things. Sorrel, is it, um, will it come back year to year? Yes, it is a perennial, yes. the red veined and the green. Yes. Okay. Can you talk about a little bit about planting onions? Um, feeling like mine have dried out. Yeah. And so if you guys saw uh, Molly's quick, quick, quick class on onions, um, yeah, give us a couple pointers. 
Cool. So, um, yes, and you got leeks, and I think you may have had a choice between onions and potatoes for the garden resource program pickups, right? Um, so, uh, onions can be a challenge because they don't have tons of roots. Um, they don't have a lot of roots and they dry out quickly. So, um, I kind of, I put them separate in my garden because I handle them a little differently than everybody else. Um, yeah, so, and they also, if you planted your onions correctly, you planted them fairly shallow, like like only like an inch or two, a half an inch or something like in the soil. So they've got a whole bunch of green that's just exposed to the elements, tiny number of roots, and just like a little, they're in like the first couple of inches of the rain. Yeah, so yes, make sure that you're watering them uh, regularly because they're so shallow and um, we tend to lose, I personally tend to lose some onions um, if I'm not diligent about it. They also tend to get lost in the weeds or if you have a, a garden patch that has a lot of grass that's still like trying to come through, they get lost. Um, and unfortunately there isn't a great way to bring them back to life. Um, and also they have a really long season um, where they, you know, they get planted and then they bulb. So there's really like, there's, they have a really kind of short window where you can be planting them and then still get a really decent sized onion out of it. Um, mm -hmm. So with some of those, unfortunately you may have missed your window to get like a, to get replacements. Um, but for those that are left, make sure they're well weeded and make sure that you're watering them uh, regularly um, okay. until they're well established. Good. So we got about 10 minutes. This is making me think we should just do one class where we just just answer like an open class, right? Like a bunch of questions uh, with a few folks from staff. I think that that might be on the docket for early June. Well, um, we're chatting over here. Yes. Yeah, there's like 30 <laughs> questions in the queue, but I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. So quick tip on uh, caring for oregano. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, do your best to like good luck containing it, <laughs> I think is it. So it's a perennial. Um, uh, it uh, establishes slowly, but once it's there, it will spread. So make sure that, you know, it's like a, a, a clumping mound that, that kind of like starts to send out more of itself in an area. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, I guess watch out for that in your end of year two, um, for it to start kind of like branch, you know, kind of like increasing its footprint. Um, keep it well watered. Um, and, uh, it's got kind of like a more like a, like the roots are a little more fibrous. Um, and they're also, they form the ones we gave you are in like these little plugs. Um, definitely like mixing compost when you plant it, keep it really well watered. It's going to tell you when it doesn't have enough water. Um, it's going to like wilt and you'll see it. It's obvious. Um, so keep it well watered and maybe just like scratch some of those roots a little bit before you plant it just to like, like encourage it to set out more roots because they are so small and they are like so little, the root system on it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then let's see if you have started some plants inside um, and you need to take them out. Yes, definitely harden them off. If you have uh, questions on that, uh, give Molly an email or I an email. I'm going to also follow up where you'll get a recording. You'll get some of the um, documents that um, Molly suggested to plan your garden and, and a few other, make sure you get the hot crop uh, thing. So we'll, we'll send an email out with those. Uh, Joshua, if you're figuring out how to join, jump on our, our website, keepgrowingdetroit.org, and there's an application process, or shoot me, me an email, tee -E at keepgrowingdetroit.org for, uh, for more help on that. Um, what do you think about planting flowers in containers and placing them throughout the garden area? Good idea? Bad idea? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, um, I think, yeah, I think people are better at me. What I do is I forget that I put the pot over there and then I don't water it. So if you're more diligent than I am, yeah, go for it. And that gives you the added flexibility of like, 
this spot isn't great for this plant. It's struggling. I'm going to put it over here or like, you know, like move shifting things around. If, you know, you think it's a sunny spot, but by the end of the summer, it's not. Now you have the flexibility to move it. Go for it. Yep. And Molly's email is Molly at Keep Growing Detroit. I'll also CC her when I email you guys out some of the recording and the documents. Um, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, we had Betty wanted to. Um, Betty, are you ready to unmute? Let's see if she wants to talk. Um, if you want to talk, you'll have to unmute yourself. Let's see. Um, Betty, I'm going to lower your hand. If you still have a question, feel free to raise it again. Um, lots of people saying they... Uh, I, T, I see one. Can I address it? Yes, please. <laughs> cool. Um, and now it's gone. Tony. Tony. Uh, <laughs> what, what color should our hot crops be? Mine are almost brown. Yep. Like this? I'll bet. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of things might be happening there. One is that these plants are old-er-ish. Um, they're, they've been in their homes for a while, so you can kind of see that their roots are running out of space. Um, this doesn't mean that the plant is dying. This means that the plant has maxed out on uh, its space. Um, also, the amount of like fertility. We add compost to our potting media um, when we plant these guys up and prick them out. So it's been in here for a while. Like it's not, you know, sometimes we foliar feed, but like it's not getting anything more out of this material to like help. Um, also, if we're watering too regularly, which happens, um, it can actually change the soil pH, which means that even if the right nutrition was in here, the plant can't access um, certain uh, uh, nutrients, specifically um, um, phosphorus, when the pH changes, which makes it look kind of purple, right? Um, so what, so it purplish brown, right? Um, so doesn't mean that the plant, the, means the plant is like, oh, plant me, but it doesn't mean that it, it can't thrive once you plant it in your garden. So again, pick off these leaves add compost into the hole, plant half of it into the soil, and then watch for these new shoots, um, the newest part of the plant to green up. Um, it will, trust me. This'll, this'll turn green, some of this purple will disappear. <laughs> I think we got through all the questions, Molly. <laughs> there was like 30 piled up and I was like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> all right. Thanks guys for joining us. Um, I, uh, um, oh, Emily, don't go to Meldrum. Everything is closed this season. Give me an um, email and we'll talk about how to uh, get going since we're going to jump off now. It's three o'clock. We've been on here for two hours. Um, oh my gosh. I think we're going to do a Q and a Molly, are you down? Let's do it. <laughs> let's get a Kilo in here too. <laughs> yes, let's get let's get a lineup and just throw yep. questions at you. <laughs> um, <it> Leslie, <laughs> I got some cages just the other day at Myers. You can go to Home Depot or Lowe's uh, for tomato cages. Um, uh, Magna says this is a good class. A lot of folks liked it. So thanks so much, Molly. Thanks guys Thank for joining us. Look for that follow up email, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch. Peace. <laughs>